Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'll just kick it off with a couple opening comments to try and frame why we put this program together this way. John and I are now in what we call the four-part team that supports Homeland Security. And most of you know the three parts, the people, the processes, and the technologies. The fourth part is the one that John and I talk about a lot and we want to share with you, the partnerships. We're both out of government now, so we have a different perspective on the touchless passenger, on where facial recognition and the biometrics have come from in Homeland. And relatively speaking, we're doing a stage set so that Austin and Deputy Sabatino can have some more fun and talk about where they're going next, what they're working on, and emphasize that because our role as partners is to support them in every way we can. The government affairs, government relations, and all of you, we're the people who are talking not only to our FSI partners, other government members, but our other group, the congressional. We have to message to them why things are important. And with the relationships that John and I have acquired over the year, it's a good audience when you're going in and they know who you are, they accept you, they trust you, you're gonna have a lot better conversation. And we wanna share with you some of the thoughts that we think are critical of how we got to where we are now. So John? Sure, thanks. And thank you for that kind introduction. And Megan? Having thank me you. Uh, here today, it's nice to be remembered when you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, the, the, the touchless travel, the history here is real important, right? Because this, um, and I'll give a quick history of, of how we got to where we are today, but you know, this came out of a recommendation from the 9-11 Commission, right? That the government needed to biometrically confirm when visitors came into the US and when they left. We were already doing biographical tracking, but you know, the 9-11 Commission recommended a, a biometric confirmation of that. So we knew who was in the country, who was overstaying their visas, and who left. Um, so over the course of several years, Congress implemented several pieces of legislation, you know, mandating the, the requirements of biometric-based entry exit system. Um, DHS implemented the arrivals portion. And not that it was easy, but it was easy in the sense that there was already a, a discrete process for arrivals. Every single person arriving in the US goes before, used to be INS and Customs, and now the new agency under DHS, CBP. And you know everybody's funneled from the plane to that arrivals hall, and you meet with a CBP officer and um, you know, go on your way or you know, go in for other inspections or other things. So departures isn't the case. You know, the US never set up the departure system like in a lot of countries around the world, like Europe. Mm -hmm. You see a border control officer, and you have to get your passport stamped to leave. Like the U.S. wasn't designed that way. Yes, we had departure or outbound authorities. We did outbound enforcement things, but they were nuanced. They were targeted. They were directed. Um, there wasn't a place where we funneled all international departures to. So you have internationals commingling with domestic flights. You have U.S. citizens and permanent residents commingling with visitors. So where do you put a biometric collection? into that process, right? We all travel through airports. We know how congested they are. You know, we know how stressful travel is for a lot of people, we know how confusing it can be. So where do you put a biometric collection in there? And, you know, DHS tried uh, several different efforts over the years. They put up some, some self-service kiosks. You know, they, the technology would work, but it was more where do you put it to be effective? Mm -hmm. uh, Congress got increasingly frustrated with DHS. I think they withheld money from the secretary's office once or twice, right? If they didn't get the plan on how to do biometric exit. Um, S&T studied it and looked at, okay, the biometric process, which we're gonna come back to, mm -hmm. that biometric process, if you did it at different places in the airport, what's the impact? So do you do it at the airline check-in counter? Do you do it at the TSA checkpoint? Because that's never congested either, right? Do you do it at the boarding area, right? Because that's never congested. How do you do this? Well, sorry. So they looked at the impacts of doing this at the different locations. And it really never, a feasible plan never developed. 
DHS ended up publishing a notice of proposed rulemaking, I forget the year, maybe 2009 or 10, and just said, basically, airlines, you figure out how to collect biometrics from departing visitors and provide them to DHS. It might even specify fingerprints, I don't remember. Um, airlines, airports, travel stakeholders didn't take too kindly to that because it dumped the government's problem on them in a lot of respects. Uh, you know, you talk about the cost and the congestion and the confusion and, you know, the airlines at that point are trying to move away from check-in counters. I mean, who still goes to the check-in counter every time, right? Like, you're going to force people to go back to that when they're trying to automate it. This is when, you know, mobile boarding passes are just starting to, mm -hmm. to happen. Um, so it was running counter to a lot of the, the airlines' plans. So a lot of tension there. Um, 2013, I believe, Congress transferred the exit mission over to CBP. Right. Entry exit. And some of the people in this audience know entry exit real well. So it landed in my lap, right? And <laughs> my staff, you know, we tried and ran a couple of pilots. We really didn't have a good sense of how are we going to approach this. Um, to make a long story longer, <clears throat> what we looked at was the biometric collection process itself, right? And there was this pre-scripted way that DHS did biometrics. To collect biometrics, you had to read the passport. It does a biographical match first. It finds the biometrics associated with that person. You take the biometrics and it does a one-to-one -one match. Then it does one against various enforcement lists, mm -hmm. right? All in, we'll call it real time. So that made a complicated process because there's several steps in that transaction. So, you know, I was thinking, I'm like, well, our national targeting center already has all the airline data. We've already vetted the biographical data. We've got what we call a hot list of all the people we want to see before they depart. And we'd be at the, the, egg, the gate, the departure gate, waiting for that person. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a warrant out for your arrest, we'll be there to place you under arrest. The, uh, the Times Square bomber, we were there at, the, at JFK before we boarded the plane to, mm -hmm. to apprehend him. I said, and we can look at the biometrics when we're doing that pre-departure targeting. I said, so what if we just took everybody's biometric from the manifest and just held it in a place, and when we encountered the person, we would just take a biometric and run it against that very small subset, right? So we're still doing a biographic match, but we're using the airline transmission <coughs> of the APIS data your advanced passenger information, basically your check-in data, which we're getting prior to departure. It's the point where you actually go to print your boarding pass. So we could pull the biometrics associated with that person. We could put it into its own, we'll call it a gallery. And then when we encounter the person, we don't have to do the biographical check anymore because we're just doing one to a small many. We ended up on facial recognition because number one, it's easy to take a picture. We had U.S. citizen photographs from the U.S. passport database. So what we could do is bring this to the airline and say, just board the plane the way you normally do. Just take a picture as they're boarding. And, and one point that we had to focus on early, this was voluntary. The traveling public were voluntarily providing their information. And that was a major part of the argument with different privacy groups and with the Hill. And that took a great deal of back and forth to negotiate all of those hoops, but it was voluntarily provided. So that's a key aspect. Yeah. And, you know, they, like the airlines wanted no part of this when they caught wind of it. They sent me a very nice letter that we want no part of this. This yeah. is your responsibility. Um, but we got an airline uh, at the time to test this with us, and it worked really well. A partnership. Right. Delta said, yeah, let's a try this out. And we put it on a laptop. We set a camera up in Atlanta. And as people boarding the plane, we took their picture. And you could confirm them real quick who they were. So we said, OK, can we take that confirmation and run it through your departure control system and check off your, your boarding pass? You don't actually have to read the boarding pass. So we can have a true mm -hmm. one-step, tokenless, touchless process to board the plane. So you don't have to check passports anymore. You don't even have to read boarding passes anymore. So we tried that, and it worked. Next, we know JetBlue was calling. Hey, we want to do this. Next, we know Orlando calls. We'll pay for all these, right? And we had this momentum building that, you know, the airlines and airport authorities source of value into what we were doing. We weren't just dumping a problem on them. We said, we're actually going to automate your boarding process, mm -hmm. and we're going to speed it up. And some of the time in motion studies we did. And it's less, 
like le less things the gate agents have to worry about. Because you've seen, if you board an international flight, they're checking passports, they're reading boarding passes, they're dealing with questions, they have a million things going on, right? If they could just have a, a, a structured process that, look, people boarding the plane, looking at a camera, and they're smiling, right? It's people mm -hmm. smiling as they board the plane. JetBlue used to make jokes with the kids. Hey, stick your tongue out at the camera, right? It still works, still matching. When they get the green check mark, the kids would love it. So it was really changing the, the atmosphere and the dynamics of the boarding process, but making it a lot quicker and just simpler for people. Yeah, and, and I need to interject one point. Notice that the work that John is describing was done primarily between CBP and TSA. There were other parts of the DHS structure involved. There was the relationship with S&T because they were responsible for certifying. And John and I were discussing the, the aspects of that. But several different parts of Homeland had their chartered areas. But we had to figure out in the operational side, how do we bring this together so it will function for the American public? And believe me, we had as many of the problems in-house as we did out of house. Yeah, I mean, we set this up as a public-private partnership, right? So the airlines, the airport authorities could pick their own vendors. We would say we were camera agnostic. So whatever thing, whatever can take a picture and you can transmit it to us in this format, you know, we'll take it. We would use, we had space in the AWS cloud. We were using the algorithm from NEC. Mm -hmm. The government owned the match. We had some business rules about the photographs and the transmission back and forth, but you know, we left it open that, number one, everybody could play and have a piece of this, right? We could have the industry energized to innovate and continue to make progress in, in better cameras, better algorithms, like we're seeing today. Um, and it wasn't just a well, government-procured solution, right? So this threw the acquisition process at DHS, like, into a bit of a, a tizzy. He's being kind here because for those of you who've had the pleasure of working with the procurement acquisition process at Homeland Security over the years, you know it has evolved. And I'd like to think that it's systematically gotten somewhat better. But it was a major hurdle working through the procurement acquisition in order to achieve what John is describing. It's like they saw it as risk that the government didn't own the endpoints, the cameras. They said, well, you're relying on the airline to keep that camera in operation, so mm -hmm. that's a risk for you. I said, no, that's less risk for the government and less expense. The airline's gonna be using that to board the plane, so I'm pretty confident they're gonna keep it up and running, right? And our internal IT people have a lot less things now to worry about, because they got enough on their plane, they got enough mm -hmm. things to keep up and running, and we shared the responsibility here, right? And we built a very lean infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we built very reliable components of this, mm -hmm. right? So your downtimes really were, were minimal. The other piece was, you know, like day one, right? You know, it's like you get a new job or a promotion, you got all this ambition, you get all these great things you want to do, and we listed out a hundred things we were going to do with this technology, right? You know, everybody's going to play a part. It's going to be not only curb to gate, it's going to go past the airport to your hotel or, you know, to the theme park. So like we just <laughs> had this ambitious vision. Right. But as you go along over the years, right, you know, you you have to address the privacy concerns, right? You got to look at the, you know, how do you really do this? Like, can you actually bridge this to some of the private entities beyond but part of the travel continuum? And how do you address those privacy concerns? Uh, you know, they're important. Um, you know, how do you, the limitations of sub certain technologies, right? The practicality of what you're trying to do, the funding, all these things change and what i found with some of that acquisition process it was very rigid you were locked in in a lot of respects to what you said you were going to do on day one so fast forward a couple of years we get to the end for level what it was a three certification or something and you know s t doesn't want to declare our system was it effective i think was the word they used because you said you were going to do these 100 things and you only did 50 of them and i'm like Okay, but these other 50 things we changed along the way because you've got to adjust. You've got to be flexible when you're innovating and building something from, from nothing. Um, like, how do you adjust that as you're going through this acquisition process? So at the end, you know, so, well, you didn't do these things. I said, yeah, but 
only thing we have to measure here is what did Congress tell us to do and does it do it? Can we take a biometric from a departing visitor and match it up to the biometrics they gave when they arrived or when they got their visa? Yes, the system does that. So it's not about all these other pieces, about are the airlines using it? What's the saturation rate? What about mobile devices? What about all these other things? I said, yeah, those are all nice to haves, but that's not essential to does this work? These are add-ons we can add on down the road should we work through some of these very significant privacy issues, civil liberties issues. And, you know, is this what the public wants and would they be accepting of that? But let's just, just, let's just measure the, why don't we punish ourselves like this? Let's just measure what's required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lessons learned, but, you know, really looking at how does a public-private partnership fit into that process? How do you be flexible so you don't get buried with the sunk costs and you keep going down a path you know might be wrong, but because the system doesn't let you out of it, you're kind of funneled into that, right? And you are, and one of the essence of going forward, and, and we're priming this now for our follow-on speakers, is the partnership approach and the experiences that I know, Stan, Oscar, you've had in Lidos. I go around the room, I see my business partners that Dell has teamed with repeatedly. You know these lessons learned of how you have to partner in order to go forward. And it really takes the working back and forth in order to achieve. It, it's, it's not an easy transition because internally, we had four different parts of Homeland that were almost preening themselves to control their part of this process, making it more difficult for John to move forward operationally. And, and he'll tell the horror stories there, but that's fact. And we've all worked through this as partners in working with government. So this is going to only get broader and wider as all the modalities of transportation are seeking an improvement in their security and the citizenry exchange their experience. We're all about customer experience today. So it takes both sides in order to focus to improve that customer experience. And we're being measured. Right now in our today's society, that customer experience is being called out more and more. So the partnership effort has to step up to meet it. Good. Questions? Good. And we're going to throw it out because there's a lot of experience around this room. What questions do you have? Because we've tried to paint a picture of what has gotten us here. Post 9-11. 9-11 Commission came out with the first requirements. It took us in the headquarters almost four years to delineate, okay, we've got a requirement. How do we operationalize it and go to the components and the offices? And in some ways, we had people leaning forward over the desk. Oh, I got that. And, and let me tick them off. Procurement Acquisition said it. OBIM said it. I didn't hear the same eagerness from CBP and TSA because they were more concerned about how do we actually take this from a planning and design and work it through? And the first pushback we got was from the airlines. Airlines say, wait a minute, you're imposing another unfunded mandate on us? No, 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 no. Then we got a little bit of pushback on the privacy side. Okay, but by being willing to engage and talk through the different concerns, we overcame that. So partnership again. The contractors that have supported through the different offices had to align and find ways to work together. And that's not always easy. And I will say bluntly, my biggest problems in the operations side were in dealing with the sea levels <laughs> procurement acquisition. They wanted to do it their way without talking or listening to CVP and TSA. So these are the efforts that we have to double down on going forward. And any questions you've got as far as thoughts you have or recommendations, we want to be a forum here where we can bring this information together so that both Chief Sabatino and Austin know they've got partners, that you can ask us to go to the Hill, message through our government relations and affairs, and carry some water here. Because we're all involved, 
And, and this won't be a success in the going forward unless we have this kind of partnership. You know, the other piece of the 9-11 Commission recommendations was looking at the travel continuum as a continuum, mm -hmm. not taking these in isolated mm -hmm. installments, right? And you have opportunities to go after, you know, threats or concerns earlier on in that continuum if it's all connected together. You know, you're looking at the application for travel documents. You're looking at when they board the plane. You're looking at when they arrive, when they go through CBP, when they go back through TSA to connect to their flight to get to their destination, right? Like it's this system of systems. And, you know, then, and that's why we built a really strong partnership with TSA on this because it was, we had the data just sitting there in international passengers. So like in TVS, the Traveler Verification Service, uh, you know, so why not put this at the checkpoint and let TSA leverage part of this too? And then could that be a platform or a structure for some of the bigger work? So they've got a lot more domestic passengers than just international ones. Like, could this, does this help them with what they're trying to do? But so we don't have these independent silos as we continue to work through. And when there's a threat, it's all one chain of events that are connected mm -hmm. through the technology that the right government agencies can then access and do what, what's required. Definitely. And I think, it, you know, a lot of lessons can be learned from the manner in which CBP constructed this, right? So you've got really strong parameters around. Number one, there's a requirement to establish your identity at the airport mm -hmm. for TSA or CBP, right? You have to have a passport to travel. Right, generally speaking, there's other travel documents, but right. So we didn't invent a new requirement there. Someone's already checking you against your passport or your travel document photo and making sure it's you. Right. Those are the only documents that feed into like the pre-staged gallery. So they're good quality photos that people have generally submitted to the government for purposes of travel. Right. You're taking a good picture say at the airport where a person knows their picture is being taken, they're looking into a camera and you can ensure you get a good quality photograph, right? Lighting conditions might impact some of that. And you know, the airports depending on uh, what time of day it is or where the windows are, you might have sun or, or, or darkness. So, so you can correct for those things. But these parameters give CBP a very reliable and quick match rate. You know, it's like 90, high 90 something percent that you're seeing because it's a limited set with quality photos, with a good algorithm and quality, uh, you know, other conditions. I would like NIST and others to study and do a comparison based on those limited factors, right? This isn't an open-ended data. Oh yeah, and when your picture's run against that limited gallery, your picture's expected to be in there. It's not like it's running against a set of random photographs of which you may or may not be in there. It's gone. Where is the person that looks like this within these, you know, thousand photos, right? So you're in there. So how does that manipulate like the, the math science behind it? You can't opt out of being inspected, mm -hmm. right? You can't opt out of establishing your identity, establishing your admissibility, right? Making your, your binding customs declaration. Like you can't opt out of that. You know, is this a, an easier, more efficient way to do it? But they got to go through the rulemaking. Got to give the public a chance to comment. There are other authorities, like, you know, as a U.S. citizen, you have to travel on a U.S. passport, right? You know, um, you know, CBP has the authority to check those passports, even in a departure area. So we brought in several different authorities into this. It wasn't just entry exit authority. So U.S. citizens are included because CBP has the authority and the responsibility to make sure you are who you say you are. We've got to determine you're a U.S. citizen to know you're out of scope of the biometric exit requirement. Yes, it is one system. Um, is it perfect? No. So there are enhancements that can be made. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, the, the seaports, commercial seaports, and, you know, Diane and, can talk a little bit about this and made great progress in bringing in the cruise ships and commercial sea travel into a very similar system as, as air. Um, land board is a lot more challenging just because of the logistics of doing it. Um, you know, if you look, though, at the numbers of, you know, say, non-American, non-Canadian, non-Mexican travelers, there are actually very few crossing the land borders. So 
What's the right approach to set up to ensure their departures are properly recorded? Like in the scenario you just mentioned, you fly in, you drive across the border, you fly out of Canada or Mexico back to your home. Can the government accurately, accurately record that? There are some biographical data exchanges now uh, between information. So some of that information is collected and it's, it's matched up. Um, that's one system that CBP uses, the arrival departure information system where all that's housed. So all the crossing records are in there. Yeah. For the sake of the program, Megan, I think we're out of time here. So we turn it back to you. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.